life. Um, another thing you need to make sure is that you are legally eligible to own the firearm that you are making. For example, you've got to comply with the National Firearms Act of 1934, um, uh, the Undetectable Firearms Act, or I forgot what year that was. But the point is, you know, you have to make sure that the technical specifications of your firearm are within the bounds of the law. What that entails, I'm not getting into right now. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, another thing I need to clarify is that improvised homemade firearms are not anything new. Seriously, improvised homemade firearms have been around for years. A lot of examples of homemade firearms can be found, well, all over the world. And they've been used for both good, neutral, and evil purposes. For example, the firearm there in the bottom left, that was used against the Nazis during World War II. I believe it's exhibited in France along with the National Liberation Museum. So, again, homemade firearms are not new. Now, another thing I need to state, uh, in the United States, there's only one piece of a firearm that is legally a firearm. Normally, that is the piece that interfaces the fire control loop with the barrel trim. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. But the point is, there's one piece of the firearm that is legally the firearm. Now, on the contrary, the rest of the pieces of the firearm can be bought and sold, absolutely no questions asked. Which means, if you can get your hands on that one piece of the firearm, you can effectively make a gun. It's not that hard. Um, another thing I need to state, uh, the law is normally fairly black and white as to whether or not that one piece of a firearm is a firearm. Now some manufacturers will sell incomplete one piece of a firearm, oftentimes are marketed as 80% complete. Um, now that requires you, the end user, to fill out some metal or plastic in order to make it a finished piece. Um, I would say that's probably the easiest ways if you want to legally make your own firearm. Um, now, there are other means of making a firearm from the ground up. And that's why I like to say, the phrase, I built a gun, kind of exists on a spectrum. On one end, you have people who exaggerate. Yeah, I've run into those. I'm not talking about them. Um, but I put a little screw right there because oftentimes when people say, I built a gun, what they mean is, I purchased all the pieces for a fire and I screwed them together. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the catch is, in order to buy that one piece of the gun that's legally the gun, you have to go through a licensed firearm dealer. That is unless you go a little further down the spectrum and you actually make the piece yourself, whether that be meeting the legal minimum of manufacturing that one piece on your own, or perhaps fabricating it from the ground up. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, if any of this stuff even remotely interests you, I just want to knock this out of the way real quick. I got one simple piece of advice. Just get a 3D printer. Now, getting a 3D printer is easier said than done. It's important to remember that 3D printers are not household appliances yet. You cannot buy one, plug it in, push a button, and expect it to work like magic. Uh, getting a 3D uh, printer to work takes a significant amount of time and patience. I would personally compare it to a 3D printed hour class. But then again, I'm in the College of Business, so take that for what it's worth. <laughs> so, um, in order to make a few recommendations, if you actually do want to buy a 3D printer, the printer on the left, that's called a Creality Ender 3. It only costs about $200, which is remarkably low. Now, it's not perfect in my opinion, but if you want the bare minimum of uh, having a functional 3D printer that can make some pretty solid parts, that is what I would recommend. If you're looking to get a little more for your money, I would recommend the printer on the right. That is a Prusa Mark 3S. The build kit will cost you $800. You can also have it assembled for you for an extra fee, but I personally recommend building it yourself because you really get to learn a lot about how it works by building it yourself. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is if you live on campus, you cannot have, let alone make a firearm. But you can have a 3D printer, and you can make innocuous things with it. Um, so if you're looking to get started, no matter where you are, seriously, just get a 3D printer. And another question I need, to, I need to address before someone asks me, can you just 3D print this stuff for me? The answer to that is a hard no. You need to be the manufacturer of your own firearm, and that is completely non-negotiable. That means using your own, your own labor, your own tools, and of course your own 3D printer. If you want more information on how to get started with 3D printing, I recommend checking out this website, uh, controlpew.com, that is ctrlpw.com. Um, their website contains a pretty nice variety of you know, getting started guides and tools to get started with a 3D printer. Um, all around good information. The link is on our student organization webpage. So with that out of the way, let's talk some history. So as I said, improvised homemade firearms are not anything new. They've been around for years now. But what is somewhat new are published guides on how to manufacture firearms. Now, by somewhat new, I mean 1998. In 1998, a British man by the name of Philip Moody published a book titled Expedient Homemade Firearms. Now, Expedient Homemade Firearms detailed the directions on how to make a nine millimeter submachine gun. 
Um, now, for a handful of reasons, this particular firearm is not legal in the United States under most circumstances. One of the biggest, re one of the biggest reasons being that it is fully automatic. Um, but Looney was British. All firearms were illegal for him anyway. Um, so obviously publishing expedient homemade firearms brought him under some pretty intense scrutiny. Um, and shortly after he published it, he was caught. Want to get it. So he was sentenced to four years in prison. And want to guess what happened after he was released? <laughs> Oops, he did it again. <laughs> Multiple times over, too. Uh, and he actually got away with it until 2009. Uh, he was arrested in 2009, and he died, of, yeah, he died in custody in 2011 due to colon cancer. Um, but in 2012, a man by the name of Cody Wilson founded the Houston-based defense contracting group commonly known as Defense Distributed. Now, Defense Distributed is credited for a whole bunch of things, including the uh, design and the publication of the first ever fully 3D printed firearm, commonly known as the Liberator. Um, now, the Liberator was a single shot 9mm handgun, and it was notorious for blowing up. Um, <laughs> but it was a proof of concept. This was the first firearm that really used 3D printing as a method of manufacture. Now, it didn't take too long for Defense Distributed to end up in a little hot water, of course. Um, shortly after publishing the technical data for the Liberator, uh, the U.S. State Department sent them, uh, sent them a takedown notice telling them that you can't publish that online because that constitutes a violation of ITAR, or International Trafficking and Arms Regulations, pursuant to the Arms Export Control Act of 1976. Now, Defense Distributed didn't like that very much, so they sued the State Department, claiming that ITAR was violating their First Amendment rights. And in the summer of 2018, they were actually granted a settlement. And that settlement lasted for about a week. You might remember that one week because it was all CNN we talked about for that one week. Um, so, the reason it only lasted for one week was because the state of Washington and a handful of other states that ended up suing, that, suing the State Department, claiming that the settlement was not within their ability to make, claiming it would cause irreparable harm to national security. Of course, with no regard to any of the history of improvised firearms or homemade weapons for that matter. Um, but anyway, so the settlement was restrained and the case is still ongoing. So as of today, it is still illegal to publish technical data for ITAR controlled items, which include very specific pieces of firearms, um, onto domains that could cross international lines, also known as the internet. Now, for the record, this does not mean possessing the files is illegal. This also does not mean transferring the files within the country is illegal. So that means if, if I want to hand the files to any of you, that would be okay. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a very, this is a highly oversimplified explanation. If I told the whole story, we'd be here for hours. If you want to hear the full story, I recommend checking out the right to own share arms. Uh, by Josh Blackman, the uh, Defense Distributed Journal, and of course, the Islamist <coughs> Organization webpage. So, that's a little bit of history of the legal situation. Let's talk about some guns that I've been printed. We're going to start with the Ruger 1022. So, the Ruger 1022 is a semi automatic rifle platform designed in 1964. It shoots a 22LR cartridge, which is incredibly cheap. Uh, the low recoil of the cartridge and the great price of the firearm makes it fantastic for new shooters, especially children. It's also great for hunting squirrels and rabbits. Uh, so I wanted one, and I legally own one. So I went through the process of legally making one, starting, of course, with the receiver. This is the one piece of the firearm that is legally the firearm. Now, 3D printing that was fairly straightforward. I think it took, I don't know, maybe 12 hours. Um, and all I had to do was buy the rest of the pieces online, and I stuck them all together. And that's how I made the Ruger 1022. Really, it's that easy. <laughs> Let's talk about another one, a Glock 17. For those of you who don't know, the Glock 17 is a semi-automatic 9mm handgun introduced in 1982. It wasn't the first classic handgun, but it was the first to really take off. Um, so this is the older brother of the Glock 19, which is quite possibly one of the most popular handguns in America. And I wanted one. And as soon as I was 21, I was legally eligible to own one. So I went through the process of making one, starting with the frame. This is the one piece of the handgun that is legally a handgun. 3D printing one was fairly straightforward. It only took about a day and a half, if I recall correctly. Um, after I 3D printed that, all I had to do was buy the rest of the pieces online and stick them all together. Well, that's how I made a Glock 17. <laughs> Too easy, right? You know, this presentation would be way too short if that was all I had to talk about. 
I obviously wanted a little bit more of a challenge. And this is where the FGC9 comes in. So for those of you who don't know, the FGC9 is a semi-automatic 9mm carbine platform. The name literally means fuck gun control 9mm. <laughs> <laughs> It was released about a year ago by an individual living somewhere in Western Europe. We actually is, we don't know. He wanted to make a firearm and own a firearm, albeit illegally in his country. But here in the United States, if you can legally own it, you can legally make it. Now before I go forward, can anyone tell me why this firearm picture here is not legal under most circumstances in the US? Yes. Yes, this is a short barreled rifle. So in order to make this legal, you have three options. You could either you know, serialize and apply for a tax stamp, pay $200, wait however many months for the ATF to get back to you. I wasn't going to deal with that. Uh, you also have the option of removing the stock and making a US legal handgun, or giving it a 16, a, at least a 16-inch barrel and making a US legal rifle. I opted to give it a 16-inch barrel and make it a US legal rifle. Now the thing with the FGC9 is, is that the 3D printing is actually the easy part. Um, unlike the other designs, this one piece does not simply make that one piece you're legally obligated to make here in the United States. Uh, while the other firearms I made use about you know, one 3D printed piece, the design pictured here uses 17. Uh, the one I ultimately ended up making uses 21. Now, if you can run a 3D printer, you're about 85% of the way there. The tricky part, of course, is procuring the pieces that are not 3D printed. We're going to take a moment to talk about this, starting with the fire control loop. For those of you who don't know, the fire control loop is the trigger and hammer assembly. This is what makes your gun tick. That is, it's unloaded. It's loaded and goes boom. Um, anyway, so the FGC9, you use the same fire control loop that you would find in any AR-15. And in the United States, those can be bought and sold, no questions asked. And that's just what I did. But if you're up for more of an adventure, or if for some reason that isn't an option, don't worry, we got you covered. Some individual found a particular model of an airsoft rifle that could be cannibalized, um, not hurt slightly, and you can use that instead. Also, only about a month ago, uh, a couple individuals designed a 3D printable fire control loop that uses a flathead screw to supplement where the hammer contacts the firing pin. Um, and yeah, that works. That was actually a fairly new development. Um, anyway, that was fairly straightforward. The bullet in your guns is a little bit more complicated uh, for a few reasons. The biggest being, this isn't something you can buy commercially. This is something you have to make yourself. What the bullet here actually accomplishes is multifaceted. Um, it starts with the firing pin. This is the uh, little shaft that makes contact between the camera, the fire, and the loading cartridge. Um, the firing pin runs, along, runs along a little channel inside the bolt. This is the piston that gets rid of old casings and loads new cartridges. The bolt is then epoxied into a plastic housing, which runs along a track inside the upper receiver of the FGC9. Then we just drill tap a small hole for a charging handle and apply a buffer spray. Let's talk about how that actually works. To make the firing pin, all you gotta do is check for a little conic tip onto the uh, onto a little piece of steel hard stock, and just epoxy in a place a little shaft collar, cannibalize the spring out of a ballpoint pen, and stick them all together. That's how you make a firing pin. Now making the bolts is a little bit a little bit trickier. First, you start off by 3D printing a little jig, sticking a piece of steel bar stock inside, and drilling out the firing pin channel. Once you've done that, you gotta break out the stick welder. For those of you with welding experience, I apologize in advance. This is my first attempt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't really figure out how to strike an arc. Um, my second attempt, though, which you can see on the right, was still complete dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> a couple practice attempts later, I got it in the ballpark. That was still horrible, but eventually I got it right. So all I had to do then was epoxy a little plastic housing in a place, drill and tap a hole for a charging handle, and apply a buffer spray. And that's how you make a bolt carrier. Now the last piece I want to talk about, you know, the barrel. Now, the barrel on the outside might just look like a piece of pipe, and for some shotguns and muzzle loaders, it might just be. Um, but on the inside, it's a little bit more complicated. You need to cut out the inside of a piece of pipe into a fairly elaborate shape to do two things. You need to be able to cheat loading cartridges and to be able to throw bullets like a football. And that's not only going to be illegal in the United States, that's just so it can be, you know, at least a little bit accurate. Um, so the unfortunate thing is a lot of barrel manufacturers have highly dedicated machinery for doing this that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and is out of all of our reach. So what's the solution? The solution is electrochemical machining. So electrochemical machining is quite nice because if you're starting out with a smooth, slender piece of hard steel pipe, it can be very tricky to, it can be very tricky to cut out the inside. Now to explain electrochemical machining, I know it sounds complicated, but the process is fairly simple. 
Imagine this picture here is a cutaway of a piece of pipe, with the gray area representing the, representing the pipe. The blue area represents salt water that is perpetually running through the pipe, and the brown area represents a metal insert that made out of copper. If you positively charge the pipe and negatively charge the metal insert, you can effectively corrode the positively charged metal depending on where the negatively charged metal is applied. That means, with some fairly dedicated tool making, like this rifling manual here, you can effectively cut out some pretty elaborate shapes. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, now, I ran into a little problem though. As I said, I was trying to make a barrel that was at least 16 inches long. Um, I tried it, I had to deviate from the directions, and for that reason I completely botched it. So instead I chickened out, I just uh, purchased a uh, commercially available rifle off IGB Austria. Um, and yeah, that works just as well. And that was the story of how I made the FGC9. All I had to do was buy the rest of the film. And that bite, I could have stuck the rest of the pieces together, it worked just fine. And yeah, those are the three firearms that I 3D printed. So, one more thing. I want to talk a little bit about testing. As I said before, the truth is there's no such thing as a 3D, print, a 3D printed firearm that doesn't have issues. Uh, my first FGC9 test, it failed outright because I made the firing pin a little bit too short, like a dummy. Um, my second test failed because the secondary buffer spring became dislodged, resulting in some cartridge pickup issues and the bolt wouldn't go back and forth all the way. So I removed the secondary buffer spring, and that led to my third test. I recorded it. Yeah. <laughs> it worked, sort of. I thought the stock just came in, so I didn't know it was a whole buffer tube. But anyway, so what went wrong here? So the problem were a few little brass heat set inserts holding the buffer tube to the upper and lower receiver. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. The point is, it wasn't strong enough to hold itself together. So this is one of many examples of a time I had to go back on the design by replacing some brass heat set inserts with a couple slide in place hex nuts. That was fairly easy. Then, on my board test, Yes. And uh, Damien was 
my question is, would you be interested um, in hiring Genshin and installing it on your computer? Hiring Genshin and installing it on my computer? Well, I prefer to keep it on topic. Um, nah, that's just, uh, I'm more of a Linux man. <laughs> oh, it lasted for about two months. Yeah. And get this. It caught fire in my dorm room. That kind of looked like Riley Hall. Thank God I was there when I had it. Otherwise, I would have gone down to that genius who got the reprinters banned on campus. But, um, yeah, that, God, that thing was so poorly designed. It, it's honestly kind of funny. But, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, did you manufacture the, the Glock magazines as well? So, the Glock, I did attempt to manufacture a few Glock magazines. I haven't had much luck with that. That's just because the springs I got, I think, were a little too, a little too powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, I might get back to experimenting with that at some point. Um, also, said only had Glock magazines on hand, so it didn't matter too much. Um, but yeah, there are 3D printable magazines you can make. I just haven't had the patience or time to really test that stuff out. But I've got a second one if that's cool. That's yeah, so when you, when you um, printed the, the actual receiver for that Glock 17, how well did the, the actual parts take to the, uh, the polymer? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question um, because uh, some of you might know, we went to the shooting range two weeks ago and it actually fell apart on me. <laughs> um, but of course, this is, again, what I said, sometimes they're unreliable pieces of crap. Um, so the, the first, so with the Glock 17, I went through a few iterations. The first one, I was having slight little issues. It was actually because one of the rail blocks wasn't fitting properly. It was a little bit too loose and that was copying like, retarding the slide ever so slightly. Um, so I you know, redesigned it a little bit so it was a little tighter, printed it. Um, the problem I had was the uh, rear rails, they were, they were held in place by really small screws. Um, and those small screws, I guess, ended up being the stress point. Um, and those ruptured and the slide kind of fell off. Um, but the uh, new design now actually uses a rail system that encompasses the entire trigger well, uh, held in place by the trigger, you know, the fire control pin. Um, and I actually haven't tested it yet, but, um, it seems a lot sturdier, so yeah. Um, I mean, everyone only knows that things going to break down too eventually, but it's all part of the fun. Any other questions? Yes. What if it explodes? Um, well, that's actually a good question. The uh, thing is, none of the firearms that 3D printed have a plastic chamber, you know, where the majority of the explosion is taking place. Barrel, chamber, bolt, it's all metal. So if it explodes, it would have exploded as well. I'm not making the Liberator here. <laughs> After I think the Liberator might, because it has a screw board, it might actually be considered a short barrel shotgun under US law. Um, I'd, rather not, I'd rather not roll the dice. Uh, other questions about the answer? Yes. How much understanding of like firearm mechanics did you have before you got into this? And like how long did it take you to, I don't know, actually start coming out 
multiple pieces. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So the funny thing is, I actually did not grow up around firearms at all. I didn't shoot my first firearm until like eighth grade ISU, when a classmate was kind of got the same finger to me. Um, yeah, I knew practically nothing going in. Um, I know I played, you know that game World of Guns, where you get to, you came out with the, the three 2000s, you assemble, take apart, you know, that was about it. Um, other than that, I mean, I would honestly say a lot of the interest in the old mechanics of firearms was birthed from all this stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I honestly went in pretty much nothing. So, other questions out there? Yes, you plan on using any different materials in Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to. I would like to experiment more, more with a DuPont side cell. Um, I know fiber. I'm sorry? Carbon fiber? So carbon fiber, um, fumes. yeah, of course you have the issue with fumes, but uh, from at least the, the, you know, I read it on the internet, so it must be true. Um, from the information I've seen, carbon fiber is, unfortunately, it's very, very brittle. It's not very, at least 3D printed carbon fiber material has a lot of issues in handling shock. Um, but, also just kind of, I can also just kind of like follow the directions, but uh, you know what? If you want to experiment, go for it. <laughs> yes? Have you thought about using the 3D prints as molds? 3D prints as molds? Um, you know, there has been some experimentation with that, um, actually as far as casting bullets goes. Um, I know there there is a guide out there for individuals now living in the United States uh, to reactivate, well, nine millimeter, to, to essentially make nine millimeter cartridges by uh, purchasing old casings online, uh, stamping up a primer, um, and then uh, scraping chitin compound and gunpowder out of filthy nail gun blanks, um, and using that to rearm nine millimeter cartridges. Um, now, in, as far as making bullets goes, yeah, there was a little bit no, of a no. um, Instead of just having a 3D printed receiver, I would actually cast it out of metal. So you're talking about like investment casting? Um, I, I know there are definitely people who have looked into it. Um, I'd have to say the issue there is you know, it's a little bit high maintenance. Um, there hasn't been much experimentation, but if you want to give it a try, again, it's all out there for the taking. Like seriously, this is some real cutting edge stuff here. We're just getting some of this stuff figured out. Um, you know, as I said, I was able to make some design changes. I don't see why any of you guys can't either. And you know, there are also some way more experienced people in this room than me. I'm sure some of you saw those designs I made and thought, yeah, I could probably do that better. Again, go for it. You know, nothing will be bad. Yes. How many profiles pop? Oh, they're free. They're free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're paying more, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are you familiar with the uh, those new force force reset figures out on the market? No, oh, I completely. No, uh, we did. I guess the we did. Would you? Assume it'd be a good idea if you had the files from there the original printing. I'm sorry, I can't get this. The, the company that makes them, let's say if somehow someone in this room has a the copy of the files, <laughs> is it a good idea to 3D print a force reset trigger? Well, knowing how a force reset trigger works, I mean, legal issues aside, uh, knowing how a force reset trigger works, that would be very challenging because, I mean, I know that's, you know, so for those of you who don't know, the way a force reset trigger works, I, I honestly don't think these are going to be legal for long. Um, the idea is, uh, so, so every single time you know your bolt cycles forward, you know, it has a little bit of force going forward. The idea is the uh, force of the bolt going forward ends up pushing the trigger forward, therefore making it so it can simulate fully automatic fire without te technically meeting the definition of a fully automatic fire. Seems a little bit too risky for my taste, but. Um, I can only imagine how much force that's going to be put under. Um, so making that out of plastic could be, um, I mean, and I wouldn't say dangerous, it just probably wouldn't last very long. Um, but you know, if you can figure out how to fabricate it out of metal or find a way to strengthen it, go for it. I mean, you know, the uh, 3D printed fire control group, um, that's a fairly new design. Um, and the only little bit of metal it needed was a little screw that supplements for the hammer making uh, makes contact with the fire control. So, could it be 3D printed? I mean, if you're willing, if you're willing to take the risk, it's not going to stop you. Yes. Um, do you think there's any money to be made in this, or is this strictly something that's a hobby? Yeah. So, I, d I know that some of the people who have made these files have received donations. Um, I personally am a little bit afraid to donate to them because 
Um, I don't want to give any money to people overseas, especially if you may or may not be applying for security clearance in the future. That could jeopardize things. Um, but uh, I mean, if you solicit donations, I'm still happy. Oh, I actually do know on the uh, Control P website there is a little segment for bounties where people will propose projects and maybe get a little Bitcoin bounty if you do the project. So, and then we just got a new one. Thank <laughs> you. 